Hello and welcome. You're listening to Law and Legend with your hosts Rick Scott and Sebastian O'Dell. Every week we bring you a legendary tale inspired by the rich traditions of world folklore and mythology. This series of Law and Legend is called Strange Britannia, exploring the dark and lesser known tales of the British Upper World and its hidden beings. In this episode, Thomas is told the sad tale of a knight destroyed by a dauntless foe and the friend who tries to redeem him. This is the legend of Greysteel. And we rode and rode, and hard we rode. We rode for many a night and day, until we came to a fortunate isle that in our path was lay. Lie by, lie by, O queen, I cried, Oh, it's hungry that I must be. For by here lies a great orchard, And many fine apples I do see. Oh, touch them not, the Elfin Queen said, Oh, touch them not, I say, For their juice is ripe with the curses That fall on the earth this day. But I have a loaf and a draught of wine, And you shall sit and dine with me, And lay your head down in my lap, and more wonders I'll tell to thee. And so they crossed the river of mist to the bank of the isle, and climbed up in the morning light to the orchard. There they lighted down from the white horse, and Thomas lay down, and they ate. And as Thomas cast his eyes around, he saw a fearful sight. There was bloodied armour strewn around the trees, and when he looked closer, the severed fingers from human hands. Seeing his look of horror, the queen explained, This orchard lies in a place between your world and mine, which sometimes they call the Fortunate Isle, the Forbidden Land, or the Land of Doubt. And the lord of this place was an earl king, who all in your world knew by the feared name of Greysteel. And then she unfolded this tale. I heard tell of a venturous knight who kept a hidden country both day and night. And he that over that river should ride, strange adventures should abide. As I heard told, the keeper of this realm is no man, and yet is the greatest knight in any land. They call him Sir Greysteel. They say no man of woman born can make him yield one man to one. His name will make any mortal tremble, for they say that more than a hundred knights have fallen to his blade. But having bested every foe before me, and yet still not won the hand of the beautiful Winglane, I rode into that country, intent on facing down this legendary knight. When I arrived, I saw nothing, but heard the clatter of hooves gradually growing louder, and it unsettled my own horse greatly. And then he appeared on the way before me. He did not speak a word, but he drew his spear, for he does not suffer a man to stand within his realm. His shield was red, his spear was red, his helmet and the plates on his arms and legs all the same shade of deep crimson. His breastplate, though, was of burnished gold, and it shone out like the sun, lighting up the blood red across his armour. Mounted on a red-brown steed, he rode strong at me now. I tried my best to match his pace, but my spear broke on his breastplate, while his ran right through mine. With a second charge, he felled my horse and flung me to the ground. I drew my sword. Quickly, I avenged my own horse, and then he fought on foot as well. I am a tireless fighter, as you know, but this knight fought like no other. No blow would slow him. My own fortitude soon became meaningless. He struck at me and pierced into my shoulder. My strike broke my sword, and I resorted to a knife. I fought on, though his weapon struck me many cruel blows, and my own fell apart one after another. Finally, after one more heavy blow to the head, 
I collapsed before him. I came to. I was alive, though my horse was not. My right hand was bleeding freely, having had my little finger cut from it. I saw another knight lying nearby, whose hand had received the same fate, but who had not had the fortune to survive. I took the horse that he had abandoned there, and I rode away. I rode across the country until I came in sight of a castle. Here, Sir Aegil looked wistful as he spoke to his friend. And there is the gentlest lady alive that ever man came in misery by. Therefore I counsel you thither to rush if you have need of healing touch. She did not come from the castle, but emerged out of the forest and was dressed all in red, though golden hair shone on her head. She took me into the wood, and within a bower her house stood. There, in a chamber, she nursed me, removing my bloody armour and tending to my grievous wounds. Her name was Lilias, but she never asked mine, for she knew the shame that I felt. She gave me a bed for the night, and she played such sweet, sad music at my bedside. I never knew a lady so kind or gentle. To further my shame, I had nothing to give in return. But she quietened my thanks and apologies, and responded, I fear that once love makes you aghast, your ointments may no longer last. And now you see, my dearest brother, she speaks the truth. For I have come home, and instead of the comfort I need, my dear Wingleine has passed me by without a glance. My wounds open once again, and my body can no longer hold me upright. And with that, Sir Aegir collapsed onto the bed in front of his friend. Sir Grime cried out and ran to his friend's side. Though he and Aegir were not born brothers, Grime loved Aegir more dearly than any of his own blood. Aegir had always been the stronger of the two, and Grime had celebrated his victories. It caused him great pain to see his friend so broken, so helpless in defeat, and so forlorn in heartache. But Aegir was bruised, battered, in great pain. He needed his brother's strength now. Grime told him to lay down, and not rise until his wounds had healed. We will make sure... Grime said, that your lady never hears of your defeat. At that moment, they heard steps outside the room, retreating away from the door. Grime rose and stepped outside, just in time to see the Lady Winglane disappearing around the corner. He grimaced, and then went back into the room he shared with his friend. Who was that? Agar asked, sitting up painfully. Only my hound. Grime replied, and he bade Aegir to lie down again. When others said that they had heard Aegir now lay in defeat, Grime instead told them that Aegir had defeated Greysteel. On his ride home, however, he had been viciously ambushed by a score of thieves who had caused these terrible injuries. He had fought off most of them, but he was no match for their sheer numbers. Winglane, of course had already heard the truth from the horse's mouth, and not once in the long weeks that Aga lay in bed did she come to check upon her wounded knight. It could not be said whether Aga would survive from each day to the next, and yet he thought of nothing other than revenge. He was determined to reclaim his honour and regain the attentions of his lady. Some days, when Grime had been out, he would return to find Aegir splayed across the floor, bleeding, when he had prematurely decided he was strong enough to stand. In preparation for his glorious battle with that enchanted knight, he asked Grime to seek out an enchanted blade in the possession of his cousin. The sword, called Aegir King, had belonged to his uncle, though it was wrought in an unknown land somewhere far beyond the Greek sea. No man of woman born, it was said, could withstand the strike of that blade. 
Aegis sent his friend out with the deeds to all his lands, if only his cousin would allow him to borrow the sword. If it should not return, she could keep the lands. With this his cousin agreed, but she warned that the stories were only half true. There was no fault with Aegir King, she said, but for want of grace and good governing. I will give this sword to you, but you must be sure that its wielder is of sound judgment. As Grime rode back, he reflected. Aegir would surely avow himself to be of good governing. Yet Grime reluctantly could not agree. His friend was reckless, determined to face a knight who had already beaten him once, and he would never consent to wait until his full strength had returned. And all of this to please a lady who would spurn him at his next defeat. If Aegir took Aegir King to be his salvation, Grime might lose him forever. And so, when Grime returned, he brought a new plan. He pleaded with Aegir to be allowed to avenge his honour, and if Aegir did not recover, his life. Grime would ride across that river, enter the Forbidden Kingdom, and slay Greysteel himself. When Aegir refused, Grime recalled Lilias's words to him, saying that while he still mourned Winglane's scorn, Aegir could not have the strength to fight his foe. And since he might never regain Winglane without this victory, there was no way out. Aegir, ever the romantic, believed Lilias's words, and so, eventually, he conceded. No one could know, of course, that Aegir had allowed another to bear his fight, and so came the cunning part. One morning, some weeks after his return, Aegir donned his armour before the Earl and Countess of that land, and rode out before cheering crowds, all of them eager to see the knight who would finally kill Greysteel. He left Winglane, who turned away as he approached, and he left the town behind him, only to take shelter in the house of Grime's cousin Pallias on the road out. From there, Grime took his place, riding Aegir's horse in Aegir's armour, and made his way to the Hidden Kingdom. It so happened that Winglane knew Pallias, and on the first day that Aegir hid away in his house, she came around to call. Pallias dared not turn her away for fear of arousing suspicion, so he ordered Aegir to draw all the curtains of his bed, and then Pallias invited her in. Your friend Aegir, she said, rode out today like a conquering lion. But what cause does he have for such a boast when he was laid so low by this night before? Pallias knew that Aegir was behind the curtain and must now be rising up in rage to hear his love speak of him this way, even as he first discovered she knew about his defeat. Do you not remember? Pallias asked. The scores of knights that Aegir has defeated. He is the greatest knight of our land, as you well know, and he will not return without success. I remember the days, Winglane replied, when he showed courage, strength, and grit. And yet when he rode into the Forbidden Kingdom, he gave up a finger to escape with his life. Next time we must expect him to surrender a whole hand. Pallias feared that at any moment Aegir might reveal himself in a fit of indignance, so he began reciting a list of all Aegir's many triumphs, as well as some other extravagant ones that he invented on the fly, finishing with a claim that a king's daughter had been offered to him for defeating Greysteel, who he had rejected, due to his undying love for Winglane. It must have seemed a little incessant to someone who didn't know that Aegir was behind the curtain, and indeed Winglane rose in disgust and left the house. Pallias breathed a sigh of relief.
On the road, Grime reached sight of the castle that Aegir had spoken of, bearing precious gifts to repay the Lady Lilias. He did not know where he would find her, but he dismounted his horse beside a stream to give both of them the chance for a drink, and he peered around, searching for the bower that his friend had mentioned. From out of the trees, a lady stepped, clothed all in red. What do you search for, Sir Knight? she asked. I seek a forbidden kingdom, my lady, beyond a wide river and a mile by the salt sea. The lady's face became pale. That land is guarded by a fearsome knight, she replied, who they call Greysteel. I know it well, for it is this knight I seek. I will do battle with him and kill him if I can. Her eyes closed. And you know that he is the deadliest knight alive? who has killed more than a hundred men, that no man of woman born can make him yield one man to one? I know it. I know it, Grime said, and he drew Aegir's glove from his pouch, the glove that still lacked a little finger. The lady drew in a breath. That glove lacks just one finger. Of the knights I knew, who rode before Greysteel, there is not one finger left. He has taken their hands or legs and their heads. He took my love from me, Lord Attlestone, the truest warrior I ever knew, and then my brother too, my father's heir, when he rode to avenge my lord. Through the years I have seen many a knight ride out that way. I have seen few return. At last I swore to try no more to stop them. Comfort is all I can offer, if they come back this way. Her passion took Grime aback. He had been ready for her gentle kindness, but he had known nothing of her pain. Yet though she reproached him for seeking that battle, she invited him to eat with her, to rest a night before he fought. As he was treated to the kindest of hospitality in this place, Grime's heart began to race for this fair lady. She offered nothing but kindness and care for these knights, who constantly reminded her of her grief, grief for those dearest to her, and she asked for nothing in return. So what became of the knight that left you that glove? She asked Grime. So he explained Aegis's situation, that he did not know if his brother would survive, and the only hope he had was this battle with Greysteel. Grime thought he saw her stifle a laugh at this moment, but a second later she looked up into his eyes and said sincerely, I hope you are successful tomorrow. You are a good man. I hope your friend appreciates what you are doing for him. Grime rose early, for Lilius had cautioned that Greysteel's power would only increase with every hour that the sun crept across the sky. And the lady dressed him in his armour, before pointing him the winding path to the Forbidden Kingdom. Worried that she would not accept them, Grime left Aegir's gifts for her in his chamber, and then departed. Then he rode along that winding path, across the wide river, to the isle that lay on the far side. He spotted movement in the trees beside him, but he could not see what moved there. Slowly, he advanced along the way, holding his nerve against these unseen watchers and the inaudible whispers that seemed to pass between them. The whispers passed from tree to tree until they came to the spot beneath the elms where Greysteel slept. The air stirred. The briars around him shook, his eyes opened, and the undergrowth shrank back from him. Someone had entered his land. They would not leave this place whole. He readied his spear and his shield. He donned his boots, gloves, helmet, all of the blood-red hue. 
he untethered a great horse, a recent claim, and mounted upon it. Sat there in all his crimson finery, he took a breath of the morning air. Once again, the day had delivered him a battle. And then he rode as swift as the wind for where Grime now stood. When Grime saw him coming down the way, he drove his horse forward as fast as he could, crying, You will regret wounding my brother. He succeeded in throwing Grey Steel from his mount, but was flung into the air himself. After the initial shock of impact, Grime rose, but Grey Steel was already advancing on him. He drew his sword as quickly as he could, but the other had raised his and now struck down at Grime. Egg King caught the blow, but was forced backwards, and Grime was lucky to dodge before Greysteel could cut him deeply. They traded strikes at one another, falling back and then engaging again, trying to find their angle of advantage. Finally, Grime struck a lucky blow on Greysteel's shoulder, piercing through his armour. However, he waited too long before withdrawing, for the other did not fall back in pain. Instead, he struck immediately out at Grime's helm, denting it heavily and sending his foe reeling. In this state, Grime was not able to parry all the strikes that Greysteel now threw at him, and he took another two blows. Greysteel kept on coming. His face could not be seen, and he did not make any noise. He did not throw himself at Grime with abandon, but never hesitated either, moving with determination, fixated only upon the next strike upon his foe. Always ready when Grime made any error, which was now all too often. Grime searched in his mind and recalled the words that had been said of Egg King, that it wanted only for good governing. He stopped trying to land blows for a moment, and instead waited for a chance to dodge away from the other. As Greysteel advanced again, Grime watched him. He saw that the Red Knight moved with a slight limp on his left side, probably caused by the fall from his horse. Grime waited until Greysteel was stepping onto his weak foot, and then he twisted to his other side. As predicted, Greysteel struggled to adjust quickly, and Grime landed a blow on his arm. Greysteel's sword dropped just a little, and Grime struck out at his chest, piercing through his golden breastplate and deeply into his flesh. Greysteel fell to his knees. Now, Sir Greysteel, said Grime, pointing Eager King down at his enemy, you must yield. Surely, Greysteel replied, speaking for the first time, you have heard that no man of woman born can make me yield one man to one. And with that, he seized Eager King by the blade. Grime was caught off guard and was pulled down towards him, and Greysteel struck out at Grime's head. Grime felt the impact on his skull, felt as though it would rend apart and nearly collapse, dropping Eager King to the ground. He saw Greysteel trying to pull himself upright, and tried to reach for his blade, but his body would not listen. He stumbled forward, Greysteel stumbled upright. I will not die today, thought Grime. He will not defeat the both of us. Then Grime seized at the Red Knight's sword hand, forcing it backward, and with his one free hand, he took Greysteel by the throat. He squeezed, for it was all he could do, until finally Greysteel's grip loosened on his blade. Grime took it, and he struck Greysteel for the final time. And with that, the Red Knight had fallen. When Grime rode from that land, he did not stop to see what riches or wonders Greysteel had hoarded. He took only one thing, Greysteel's hand, of the same deep crimson as the glove worn around it to avenge Aegir's stolen finger. Battered and bleeding, barely able to ride straight along the way, Grime returned to that bower in the shade of the castle. Once more, Lilius found him on the road, and she took him in as she had so many others before. She asked no questions as she tended to him, 
So Grime wordlessly produced the red hand. Lilia stopped. She put a hand of her own to her lips, and Grime saw tears well up in her eyes. She rushed to Grime and embraced him. Weeks had passed since Sir Eger had set out on his journey. The people of his land were beginning to suspect the worst. Winglane had ceased scoffing at the thought that he might kill the enchanted knight. Now, she did not speak of him at all. Then one morning, a crowd of people rushed past her, toward the edge of the town. Winglane stared after them, wondering what commotion drew them that way. She had begun to walk on when a trumpet sounded. A knight was riding into town, towards the palace. She was dumbfounded. Aga rode there atop his horse, beaming out for the world to see, holding the severed hand of an elfin knight. Next to him were Grime and Pallias, and they smiled no less broadly. The earl and countess greeted him with great aplomb. Winglane could not believe he had done it. He had truly earned her respect now. She too greeted him, full of apology for her doubts, declaring his glory and prowess now well assured. Aga looked down at her. I'm glad to hear you think so well of me now. And yet, I have come to say farewell. Winglane gawped at him, as did the Earl and Countess. Even Grime looked shocked. You see, Aga went on, my brother Grime is soon to wed a lady. Of a far-off land, he says. Tomorrow he rides out and I shall follow. Yes, I may lose the love of a fair lady, but I can never lose the love of a true friend. Thomas awoke, for he'd fallen asleep while the Queen was telling her tale. She was now nowhere to be seen, and the mists hung thickly about the edges of the orchard. He saw movement out of the corner of his eye. It looked like a deer, a silver hind watching him from behind a tree. Though he rose for a better look, it turned immediately and ran off into the mists. There was something about those mists that made him loathe to follow. And then he heard footsteps behind him, and there the Queen reappeared, beckoning Thomas to follow once more. She mounted with him once again upon her milk-white horse, and they rode out from amongst the trees. Then reaching up into a tree, a single tree so high, she plucked an apple from a bough, as we went riding by. The apple that she picked was gleaming red and lustrous, and she took it, and she slipped it purposefully into one of Thomas's pockets. I'll eat you this one, Thomas, she said, as we went riding by, and it will give to you a tongue that can never tell a lie. And from that fortunate isle they rode on, deeper into the strange lands. And seven years they went and passed, and I on earth was never seen. And I was told to never speak these things that I had seen. I'll start off by saying that um, I absolutely love this story. <laughs> um, Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> It was, uh, you know, I've I've read it. The original is an at times very florid and dense medieval romance poem from 16th century Scotland. 
And I just absolutely love the way that you condensed that story down to its essentials, really mm. captured the essence of the characters and their relationships. Thank you. Um, and maybe tweak them here and there, which, yeah. which we'll get on to. But um, yeah, how did you feel about working on that? Well, the, um, I saw a line from Richard Curtis and his work on Blackadder, which was, um, all I can say is that it was extraordinarily hard work. So if it came out well, that would be why. Um, it was it, the the main job for the first couple of days of working on it was just condensing it down. You know, these are the key elements, and I wrote it out in slang because that was actually it. It made it feel like less of a chore. You know, it's it was it was it was things like um, you know I would write things like nah your shit when I meant you know this character said some terrible things about this other character. Um, and that, that, that helped me to get a clear idea of what people were doing at what kind of times. Um, but yeah, as you say, tweaking it a bit. The um, I, It made me realize that one of the best ways to change a story is to look up the story and go, what do I dislike about this story? You know, because you don't know where exactly you're going to take it. But you can look at the story, because I looked at um, Sir Egan's Sir Grime and I thought, to me, it feels like there's a great story here that somebody has just taken some liberties with, which were just, you know, took in a really kind of weird direction. So I cut out the bits I didn't like. I I made them go in slightly different places. Um, but yeah, it's a uh, it's a long poem. <laughs> I think we know probably both know who who you instantly dislike when you're reading that poem because. Uh, <laughs> Wow, uh, Wing, Wing Lane is a piece of work, isn't she? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I thought it was, it was quite interesting that the um, uh, the you get these quite um, stereotypical images of femininity in it. You and you get a kind of notion of uh, what people's idea of social roles were at that time, because you know you have these two women, female characters. You have the um, uh, sort of cold, callous, judgmental Wingerlane, and then the kind of the very sort of caring and maternal Lilias character. Um, and what I found really interesting about it is that they both get so in the original poem they both get married. So Aegir marries Wingerlane at the end, and then Grime marries Lilias. Um, and in the poem. Uh, Aegir delivers a rebuke to Wingling, quite similar to the one that I had him deliver. And then there's a sort of like hasty clean-up where the Earl and Countess bribe Grime to go and persuade Aegir to change his mind. And then he does, and then they all live happily ever after and have 15 children and huge tracts of land. Um, and I just thought, that if you're really going to cast Wingling as this kind of ice queen, this 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 woman who is essentially... Her, life, her love is a, a prize to be won, and she's set the highest possible price. Um, wh why not play out the arc? You know, it's it's almost as like they try to do two, like both things. On the one hand, you know, um, a woman, a fair woman's love, can be won through glory and valor. But on the other hand. The, the 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 welfare and uh, dignity of these knights doesn't kind of wait on the opinion of these women. So, you know, you give this Aegir his moment of triumph where he goes, no, Wingling, you've treated me so poorly, I I don't need you anymore. But then they kind of like, no, 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 we need a, we need a happily ever after ending. So I thought, why bother? Let's. We don't need that. We don't need that. Exactly. <laughs> or rather, this is our happy. This is our version of happily ever after. Exactly. <laughs> because fundamentally, for me, the story is about the relationship between Aegir and Grime. It's the knight who is devoted to his brother, who will do anything to see his honor restored. And, and um, so, you know, let's not pretend that the that the satisfying conclusion is both of them getting married to different people in different countries. They, they, they stick together. That's that's Aegir and Grime. Mm. Mm. The the sword, Ish King. Ish King. Yeah. <laughs> you can tell I had no idea how to pronounce it. 
I um I loved how there's almost there was almost like a, a relationship between the weapon and the character of Grime in the mm. sense that you know um, it's a it's a weapon that wins if you wield it with uh, what was the phrase? Uh, good governing. Good yeah. governance and. Um, he he beats he beats Grey Steel by you know stepping back and watching and, mm. and that kind of thing. Uh, how how much of that was in the original? Did you tweak that? At I all, did or? tweak it, although you know the the phrase is, is correct and that is what what is said about it. Um, but so the in in the original, um, Grime has already decided to take on this quest and. I think it's Pallias who tells them both about this forge that they should go and obtain. Um, and um, so at that point, Grime goes and gets it, and then the woman speaks these words to him. But then, you know, he does battle with Greysteel. And there's description of the blows that they land on each other, but no description of the thought that goes into them. So you don't see this kind of grace and good governing that's supposed to unlock the power of the sword. You get, you know, a sort of, some empty words that get spoken about it. Um, And I thought it would be more interesting to, because again, there was an unsatisfactory element with why Grime goes in Aegis place. I mean, obviously, Aegis bedbound and possibly dying, but in the end, he persuades him in the original poem by telling him that there's some other knight flirting with Winglane, and he has to stay to make sure his name is kept at court, you know, um, to make sure they're all speaking of him well at court or something. Um, and then, and I thought that actually it would be more interesting to give the weapon a more active role where it's, you know, the, the power that it has gives Grime the idea to, that he's got to be the one. And it's um, it's quite fun because it gives Grime this kind of like moment of immodesty, you know. No, you know what? I have the good judgment here. I'm the sensible one, and Ager is not. And much as I love him, and I would love to say that he would, you know, he'll beat Gracie with his weapon. I just don't believe it. Yeah, that that was a great character moment. Uh, you know, you made the weapon a metaphor for who these people are and that mm. that's great storytelling um and when i asked you to come on board with this podcast you know one of the things he said to me was oh well why are you asking me what am i bringing to this and uh, uh that's what you're bringing to it you know, <laughs> I, I heard one of your you know one of the other tales that you brought to one of our workshops um and uh you know that's what i saw in your other storytelling uh, and this is uh I feel like this is some sort of award ceremony. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I'm glad you could be here for my reading of Grace Steel. <laughs> but no, that uh, it's, it's good. I, I I really enjoyed this. Yeah. Oh, excellent. No, it, it it's it's good that that came off. I'm uh, I'm 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 glad that 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 went the way I had intended. The um, what did you think of the scene in Pallias's house where Winglane comes around? Um, so I love the scene. When I was first listening to it, I thought for a moment, oh, he's, he's done a slight misstep here because um, almost when Grime leaves, I thought we should have left with Grime and it almost mm. seemed to be unnecessary. Yeah. But then it was a great character scene and mm. I loved it and I thought, I don't know, maybe it could have been, maybe you could have followed Grime a little bit further and you could have entered Lilias's house and then you could have cut back. Yeah. But I don't know if that would have worked. I, I, I just something to think about. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's possibly a good thought. I can't remember where it fits into the the original poem, but I quite like it because it's like the the reason I kept it in was because it was just too funny to not keep in. The um, uh, it's you know we're talking about a manuscript which is from I can't remember the sixteenth century, mm. and it's got this kind of rom com scene where it's like oh. The, 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 character, the, the character's here, but he's not supposed to be. So we have to, like, 
hide him behind something while somebody like you know says awful things about him and he sort of has to resist the urge to come out and go hey shut up stop <laughs> bad mouthing me um and uh yeah so i i thought it was interesting to keep that in as an indication that that kind of humor is almost timeless you know it's it's certainly not a thing that's only arisen in the modern era that kind of awkward oh no what's going to happen <laughs> I'm almost seeing um, Sir Eger as Ross Geller from Friends. <laughs> I'm seeing the expression on his face. <laughs> he does have that kind of characteristic. It is, it is a shame in some ways. I, in some ways, that would be something I'd do more if I had more time with it, is actually develop Eger's character a bit more, because I think he comes off a little bit... Um, on uh unsympathetically he he kind of he he foolishly rides into battle he comes back and does nothing but complain um somebody else fights his battle for him and then he marries the woman um which he doesn't in there in in my telling of it um but i think you know given you've given this character of grime his unswerving devotion to Aga. You want Eger to sort of show something in return. Hmm. Yeah, so I think that was definitely what, one reason why this telling of the tale kind of almost resonates more than the the poem, you know, that that is his that is his character moment when he turns his back on Wingblame. Mm. Um and uh I I th- think that um you know, a, a character doesn't have to be completely um, sympathetic or good. Uh, you know, yeah. the, the, there are those elements to his character, but the friendship kind of transcends that as, as friendship sometimes does. Uh, <laughs> that's so I, true. I don't really see that as a problem. No, um, that's fair. Especially with the ending that you that you gave it. Yeah, good. Um, it was uh, as a as a side thing. It was um, it was very popular. This uh, poem in. Um, in uh, Scotland in the uh, late Middle Ages. Mm. Um, it, um, in fact, James V of Scotland, in fact, gave one of his courtiers the nickname of Greysteel. Um, seemingly affectionately, uh, <laughs> we have to assume. Uh, but yes, it, it would have... Uh, it would have been one of the things that was sung often, uh, like ballads about William Wallace and um, apparently, one of the reasons is actually this friendship between um, Grime and Eger, um, which apparently resonated a lot with the uh, friendship in another in a popular ballad about um, uh, William Wallace, the Wallace, um, with uh, Sir John de Graham, which they think may have actually caused um, the writers later on to change Grime's name to Graham. Oh, okay. The the names Agar is theoretically a predecessor of Edgar and Grime for Graham. But um I felt like if you could have the chance to tell a story about a knight called Sir Grime, I just you just don't pass that up really. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, Grey Steel itself is uh, an interesting name. It's a good name. Mm. Um but in a way, it almost seems to be slightly diluted by the actual description of the knight himself. You know, I don't know, like as a storyteller, you have that uh, desire for kind of like harmony between mm. all the elements. So he's called Grey Steel. You expect him to be, I don't know, his dominant colour scheme yeah. to be grey. But in fact, he's a he's a red knight uh, yeah. with a golden breastplate. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm still. Even now, unsure as to why he was given the name Greysteel. Because, you know, plenty of armour was grey, or made of grey steel. Um, but um, his wasn't, and it was made of red. That element very much, um, well, you know, this, this series focuses on a, a, a series of elfin or eldritch knights. Mm. And, you know, um, the... Strange, strange colourings are a, a sort of a sign of the other world in these tales. Mm. Uh, in um, Sir Gawain and the Green Knights, you know, I have a, a knight who is 
green from head to foot with with green armor and a green beard. Yeah. Um, and here, Grey Steel has uh, he has grey grey shield, grey weapons, and grey hands. Uh, and it, red it's, shield, red weapons, and red hands. <laughs> and yeah. demonstrating my point. But yeah, it is. It's hard <laughs> to keep, keep track of it, isn't it? Um, um, grey Steel doesn't have a lot of the kind of sort of mystical power. It doesn't have the kind of um, his his strength just seems to be uh, might, uh, the prowess in battle, unbeatable possibly, but not full of the kind of uh, magic that we would associate with the, the the creatures of the other world. Possibly, but on the other hand, um, I don't know. Maybe there's a sense in which that that power is almost assumed. You know, in, in in that whole thing about no man of woman born can defeat him, mm. and I also think the whole thing about removing the little finger kind of to me just uh, it reminds me of the you know that uh, the other cultural practices elsewhere of uh, you know the shrunken heads. Yeah. You know, you you, you harvest. Um, you know, something totemic from your enemy. Yeah. And it kind of signifies actually almost consuming their spiritual strength and adding it to your own. Mm. Uh, now, that's that's not stated, but, um, you know, it's a possible way to look at it. <laughs> I think in the text that I was reading, in, that is the suggestion of sorcery as a use for the little fingers is, is sort of heavily read into that. Certainly there is something quite, I don't know, pleasingly creepy about a knight who fells his enemies and then steals their little fingers. Um, well, it's, it's kind of odd and oddly specific, isn't it? Because mm. um, he, he, he does it to Eger and then he does it to the knight that Eger finds, his horse he takes. Mm. So he is doing this to a lot of knights. But it's interesting... Um, you, he's got red armor uh, and uh, a red horse, and all, all of the things are red, apart from the breastplate, which is golden. And then moments later in the story, you have a woman who's dressed all in red, apart from her hair, which is golden. And you think that that's got to be too much of a coincidence for them to have just kind of put in casually. There, it, it seems very much like they're trying to hint at some kind of otherworldly connection to Lilias as well. And there actually are folklorists who have argued that Lilias is um, connected to uh, Morgan Le Fay. Mm. Um, and which makes a certain amount of sense given the uh, Greystiel's land is called the Isle of Doubt. And in the original manuscript, in the uh, in the introduction, there's bits about how the uh, the river and the sea, which is a mile by the salt sea, actually cut uh, the the place into an island. Right. Um, yeah. And so you have that kind of suggestion of uh, the the blessed isle, the fortunate isle, Avalon, mm. um, from well, respectively. Celtic and Arthurian myth. Um, so the connection to Morgan Le Fay here is not necessarily all that crazy. Yeah. Um, and in fact, we've chosen to sort of accentuate that connection really with mm. the Thomas the Rhymer, the Framing Tale. Um, yeah. Because, uh, you know, the Elfin Queen um, is visiting this orchard. Yep. on an island uh, the original ballad does contain the orchard but um we've we've massaged the you yeah. know the the source material here to to put that orchard on an island yeah um and suggest you know um bring together all of these allusions mm. to the other world and to avalon because of course avalon was the land of the apples mm. where which is uh which i think can't remember whether it's Welsh or in, in, in which 
apple look something actually is the word for apple. No, I wasn't wasn't aware of that. <laughs> but, uh, but um, yeah, so so we we've de- deliberately decided to to play that up quite a bit, and it is sort of one possible interpretation because there are arguments also made that grey steel actually comes from other origins from. Uh, Teutonic origins, uh, French origins, depending on which, who, whose work you're reading. Um, but a, it's more it gives us more continuity with our our theme, the world is, we're creating. Yes. Yeah. But b, it it does make a certain amount of sense um, with with the illusions you have in the in the story. Um, Mm. Well, in some some versions of the Thomas the Rhymer uh, tale or the ballad, um, Thomas the Rhymer um, is, I believe, taken to a tree, mm. and uh, essentially it's implied that it's the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You know, they in a, they are in a sense in Eden, yeah. um, and. You know, Eden's part of this mythical landscape. You know, it's somehow part of Elfland or on the way to Elfland. Yeah. Um, perhaps because you know we've talked about, um, you know, this kind of uh, this otherworldly geography, and perhaps the mankind being locked out of Eden. It's now mm. sort of falls in this kind of like realm between Earth and Heaven. Yeah, so. I was. It, it's an interesting point. This this thing journey out to the island. Um, the I, I read that the early church really wanted the converted pagans to give up this notion of the kind of promised isle, the land of promise, to the west. You know, sighting Eden in the east, where you know the descriptions of where its rivers are match somewhere in Iraq. Um, but they really couldn't get them to do it. So in the end, it sort of became corrupted. There's there's these stories of, um, genuine stories of uh, Irish men leaving the shores of Ireland, uh, of Ireland in tiny little boats sailing west because they believe that they're sailing for these promised kingdoms that God is essentially directing them to. And I guess we have no idea how many of them drowned out there but it's said that actually they arrived at the island of Iceland and that there are some surviving kind of old Celtic names, Gaelic names, um, which um, suggest that actually they were the first ones to settle Iceland and then apparently fled when the Norsemen came. But I don't know. <laughs> wow, wow that's, that is interesting. <laughs> Next week, an English lady will need all of her wits when she is seduced by an outlandish lover and the music of his magical horn in Lady Isabel and the Elf Knight. You've been listening to Lore and Legend, Episode 8, Grey Steel. Our story today was interpreted and performed by Sebastian O'Dell. Music in this episode was performed by Robert Bentall. Additional music and sound effects were sourced from Derek and Brandon Feister of Feister Music World on Bandcamp, from freesound.org, and from freemusicarchive.org. You can find a full list of audio credits on our website. For news about upcoming episodes and more info about our stories and their sources in world folklore, find us at www lawandlegend.co.uk or follow us on Facebook and Twitter at of Law and Legend. If you like what you're hearing and you want to hear more, uh, there are a number of ways that you can support us here at Law and Legend. We're committed to keeping the episodes in the series free of adverts, but if you want to help fund and promote us simply by listening, you can help by listening to us on Podcoin the podcast app that rewards you for listening to your favourite podcasts and discovering new ones. 
Listening to episodes will earn you PodCoin currency, which you can redeem for gift cards with retailers like Amazon, or donate directly to charities like Action Against Hunger, the Rainforest Trust, and the Global Fund to end AIDS. Listening to us on PodCoin will also earn us extra PodCoins, and they promote our podcast to lots of new listeners. You can download PodCoin for free on the Android or Apple Store, so it's well worth checking out. Use the code LAWLEGEND when you register for 300 pod coins on us. If you don't want to listen to any ads at all, uh, please consider supporting the podcast through our creators page on Patreon. You can find that at www.patreon.com forward slash law and legend. Financial support enables us to keep on telling our stories and will empower us to develop more creative content for you, our listeners, in the future. If you can't afford to support us regularly but want to drop a few coins in the hat, you can do so using our PayPal link at paypal.me forward slash law and legend. And you can find all of those links on our website.